One, two, three, four. Hello, virtual geography field trippers. Dr. Brown here, wanting to welcome you here in San Marco or in uh, El Cerrito today. It is a beautiful day in El Cerrito, 63 degrees, relative humidity of 47%. But I did just get a call from a friend of mine in San Marcos, and they've just received over a half inch of rain, and uh, so they're doing pretty good too. Today is our second gathering here, and uh, I'll be talking to you. Uh, we're going to advance some of the concepts that we've talked about before. And the first thing I want to do is to uh, view a little something here as we uh, focus on the technology. Here we go. Uh, and that is uh, to remember that we're looking at the Hispano homeland. And by this time, you're probably pretty aware of how isolated it's been and why it has been preserved. And in order to set our stage for today, we want to remember that all cultural change is due to only innovation, invention, or diffusion. People think it up themselves or ideas spread. And this is going to be important because the isolation of El Cerrito and the Hispano homeland have really, uh, um, that isolation has kept this culture so much pure, at least for a long time, up until World War II. Uh, we're going to talk about archaic folk culture, the kind of culture that evolved there due to that isolation. We're going to analyze and compare the relative isolation of the homelands, a brief history. We talked about those homelands last time. Well, we're going to look at the unique aspects of the Hispano homeland that fostered the archaic folk culture to develop. Then we're going to look at some unique cultural expressions of landscape and landscapes of the archaic homeland, and then talk about the homeland in 1939. So to start with, how could I ever begin a lecture without a brief review of what geography is? Remember, geography is a broadly applicable interdisciplinary perspective that allows for the observation and analysis of anything distributed across Earth's space. And certainly the cultural phenomenon of the Hispano homeland is spatially distributed and falls into our purview. Geography first observes spatial distributions, anything that can be mapped by asking who or what is being observed, when is it being observed, and where is it. In this case, the who or the what is the Hispano homeland and the uh, associated cultural attributes that are tied to it. The when question is really taught, the temporal question of when goes from earliest settlement up into uh, uh, modern times, and we know where it's at, it's in northern New Mexico. Looking at that pattern, we want to begin then to investigate the underlying spatial processes by asking the questions, why did this homeland evolve there? How did it get to be that way? And hopefully, from coming to understand that, we'll be able to then uh, make some predictions. We may not be accurate, but make some predictions about why, uh, uh, why we think that homeland evolved and what might happen to it in the future. That's our application process. So beginning of this, let's talk a little bit more, if you remember from last time, innovation and invention. People think up ideas themselves, not very likely. All of us, our lives change all the time, but it's not because we think those changes up, but instead we get those changes through the media, from friends, through the global marketplace. And so spatial diffusion is really the critical thing that results in cultural change. And uh, barriers to diffusion, such as we're gonna find dominated the Hispano homeland, stop uh, the change from, change from resulting diffusion. Isol in the face of isolation, change is very slow. Not much takes place. Remember, we talked about, for example, the English-speaking people in the Appalachian Mountains, isolated from the rest of the English speakers for about 100 years, and when they were rediscovered, they were old-fashioned, old-timey, or could we say archaic? What a great word. The French in Canada, isolated from the French in France, and then the French from Canada that went to Louisiana really were isolated, and that archaic uh, Acadian culture evolved. That is a definitely, certainly a, an archaic uh, uh, type culture. And in New Mexico, we have those same isolation factors. We talked about the differences between the homelands. So let's take a look at the Spanish homelands very briefly. And we're looking at the three major ones. There was also uh, some settlement in Arizona, but we're mostly focused on the Tejano homeland uh, in, in central Texas, the California homeland, and then of course the Hispano homeland in New Mexico. And we know that the uh, Tejano homeland was very quickly overrun by Anglos. The uh, early uh, Spanish culture that was initially planted there was uh, bleached out by the uh, diffusion and the invasion, lots of uh, uh, migration uh, and, and the bringing of culture traits 
into uh, uh, Texas. The California homeland was pretty much a literal uh, uh, kind of cultural phenomenon along the coastal regions of California. The discovery of uh, precious minerals and then the uh, discovery of the value of the farmland in California resulted in, in that initial culture that was established, again, being pretty much bleached out, eliminated, reduced substantially. Certainly some of the uh, landscape imprints still exist, the missions and whatnot, but that's pretty much it. But in New Mexico, the Hispano homeland, remember that homeland was settled much earlier than the other ones, uh, 1595 is when the folks first settled in Santa Fe and then began to spread out. So it was settled much earlier from, than the other homelands and more directly from Spain. The settlers in the Hispano homeland did not spend a lot of time in Mexico uh, going through cultural change. They really transplanted their, uh, 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 their, uh, their culture that in isolation evolved into an archaic folk culture, the Hispano uh, culture. Okay, so uh, let's review uh, homelands a little bit. And remember that a homeland is, first of all, is an uncertain concept. Uh, it requires some elements, and one is people. There must be a unifying ethnic identity. People have this sense of belonging, self-conscious awareness. It requires that they exist in a place or a territory and that they be in that place and develop an emotional feeling of attachment. This is home. This is their land in essence. And, and a strong sense of attachment to the land, the bonding with the land is, is essential. Uh, as they're there, people adjust to the natural environment and they leave their impress in the form of cultural landscape. And we'll be looking, as you have been, walking through the village here. Uh, you've looked at the kinds of construction, the adobe uh, construction, the use of hakal for fencing, uh, the irrigation ditch, the acequia madre, the major ditch coming down from the dam on the Pecos. And then the uh, smaller acequias leading off of that, which uh, then irrigate the particular fields. For a homeland to exist, the people have to have a sense that they control the place. And we need to realize that when these people settled in these little villages, uh, they were granted permission to do so by the king of Spain, the all-encompassing all authority at that time for them. This was their land. It had been given by the king, and for them to think that they could ever have that taken away was just um, outside of their own mind. Uh, also, they have to be there long enough in t for the time, have enough time to bond uh, with the land. So, if we look at the Hispano homeland on this slide, this is out of Nostrand's book, which, by the way, let me remind you, I've ordered a copy for each of you, and if anyone's unable to make it to uh, the day when Dick is here, I'll have him sign your copy. We'll uh, bring it to you on the last day of our class meeting when we meet back in uh, real space instead of virtual space. But this map sort of shows a number of the various homelands that exist throughout the United States with the Hispano homeland really uh, emphasized here as, as, as the focus of our study today. Okay. Archaic folk culture. Uh, here we're talking about a group of people who, and let's think about that, uh, people who have been isolated, where innovation, invention, and diffusion are minimal. Uh, if we take a look at these homelands again, and we, we can see the, the patterns of migration in, I've, I've got a picture, three maps from Nostrand's book, and we take a look at particularly the middle one, you'll see the large arrows going into the uh, California and Tejano homelands. Those represent major migrations of, of, of Anglos into those areas to weaken and dilute the culture. But if you notice the arrow into the Hispano homeland is extremely small, indicating that there are very, very few outsiders coming in. Certainly, as Mexico gained independence from Spain, they did open it up to Anglos. Spain had not permitted any Anglos in the area, although some did uh, sneak in. But once it was opened up, you did have some traders and a few people coming down the Rio Grande uh, uh, River. Uh, we can look again then, and we see in the much more recent uh, uh, map, 1900 to 1980, here we begin to see somewhat of an increase of the uh, uh, Anglos and other people moving in, as well as the evolving, more popular culture, uh, Chicanos, moving into the area, which also brought a diluting factor to the uh, Hispano homeland and the archaic folk culture that, that was there. And so what we see is this geographic isolation allowed for very little change in the culture. And we're going to look at some of those features uh, very briefly. As a distinctive subculture, remember they came earlier and with exceptions more directly from Spain to the borderlands. 
After initial colonization, the Hispanos were isolated from outside contact and their numbers grew, the population got bigger and bigger, and we're gonna find that as the population along the Rio Grande began to exceed the resource capacity of the environment, uh, the King of Spain then authorized a movement over to the Pecos River. And this began to happen in the late 1700s and very early 1800s before the uh, homeland itself had been opened up during the Mexican era to uh, outsiders. So we had, during the Spanish era, we do not have many people from the outside coming in that era population becomes really thriving, this wonderful culture evolves, a number of those people move over into the isolated valleys of the Pecos and hence transplant their culture in this region. And then we begin to get the outside uh, Anglos coming in along the Rio Grande. But this, uh, the people on the Pecos were much more isolated and they're gonna serve as a better repository for the culture. It's gonna be much less impacted. So the archaic folk culture evolves out of that isolation. We can think about uh, the kinds of things that we see taking place in the Hispano homeland. Environmental adjustment. People came and adapted to uh, an arid environment uh, by uh, using irrigation to water uh, crops. You'll see the photo on the upper right. Uh, or irrigating crops on the floodplain. That was part of the economy. People had, grew fields of, of, of beans and corn, by and large, uh, hay for animals to some degree. They also had orchards planted in the village to help supplement their, their needs. And then the upland, uh, the mesa on the upland was held in common, as was the practice of the Spanish at that time. And that's where herds were grazed. And so you had this uh, additional leg of economy up on the uplands where, where people would graze their animals and, and try to make some kind of a living. Now it's important to understand, however, that these villages were never probably totally subsistent. Even in the early days, villagers, men in the village at least, would go out and work in agriculture, perhaps herding uh, the patrons' uh, uh, sheep or, or doing other odd jobs to earn a little bit of money. But over time, as the railroad came into the region, uh, through Las Vegas, a lot of jobs opened up either directly in the construction of the railroad uh, cutting timbers and ties for the rail construction or afterwards working on the railroad or if you can think about the impact of the railroad in Las Vegas, New Mexico, that really caused the economy and commerce to, to boom and that provided lots of other jobs in warehouses and restaurants, uh, all sorts of jobs began to, to evolve. And so these people were trying to adjust to the environment but they've never real, really totally subsistent but fairly, fairly, uh, fairly subsistent. Uh, they modified the environment by creating these areas where they can subsidize the uh, low rainfall with irrigation, but of course the land is very, very limited. Over time though, we begin to see a deterioration of the resource base. The uplands, when the Spanish first came, were very rich grasslands. They had been fire maintained for thousands of years. Woody, weedy species were virtually non-present, and the grazing capacity was enormous. A term that cattle people use is carrying capacity. And a small amount of land produced enough grass to support a number of cattle. Over time, though, uh, some things began to change. Uh, the Europeans engaged in fire suppression policies, and fire is what had kept the grasslands pure. Once the uh, uh, fire suppression was in place, we began to get the invasion of woody and weedy and thorny species, uh, junipers, uh, cactus, uh, unedible grasses. As the uh, rangeland productivity decreases the, and, and the grazing pressure remains high, the cattle begin to eat the, the, the good grasses for, for raising cattle at a rate beyond their ability to grow back. And pretty soon the capacity of the upland is fairly and substantially lost. During the later period, the people in El Cerrito are also going to be challenged by the English laws. The, uh, when, when the land grant is adjudicated as a part of the entrance into the United States, and at that time, people are also going to be required to pay taxes on land, and it's a cash poor economy by the time this is happening. We'll talk a lot more about that later. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to think about the land impress, and I want you to look at these photos a little bit. These represent the late 1930s. Uh, we see that the materials uh, that the homes are built out of are pretty much locally available. Rock was used for foundation, sun-dried adobe brick, and that's where you take the, the, the silt and the sands that are available along the river and you mix it with uh, paha, or you guys would probably call that straw, but those of us in the know in El Cerrito refer to it as paha. Mixed with water, put in form, sun-dried to make structures. 
Now, originally, these houses had flat roofs, and uh, they would cut long pine poles called bigas, stretch across the walls, cover those with boards, and then cover them with dirt. Um, it served as a pretty good uh, uh, kind of roof, but there were problems. Uh, it leaked when it rained. Uh, if the wood began to decay after periods of heavy snow, the weight might cause the roof to uh, collapse. And in fact, uh, when people use these kinds of roofs, they hung cheesecloth inside the, their, their structure to catch the dust and silt that was falling so it wouldn't uh, get on the table or, or on their beds, those sorts of things. When the railroad came to Las Vegas, that made it uh, economically more feasible to put pitch tin roofs. And well, I'll tell you, for an adobe structure, the shift to pitch tin roofs really reduced the maintenance and made it a, a much more uh, tolerable kind of life. Uh, you'll notice the transportation we're looking at here, people using uh, horses at the time in 1939. I think there were only two working automobiles in the village. Uh, Leonard and Loomis talked quite a bit about this. Uh, you look at the other kinds of materials, if you look at the fencing in the larger picture on the left, and we see that they've just cut uh, uh, limbs and, and twigs to build fence, that's called hakal fencing. Uh, we see a lot of rock used for the animal structures, the barns and pens in order to keep them in. And it definitely looks like a, a unique cultural landscape. These little villagers are different than what you'd find in most other parts of the United States and reflective of, of that culture by and large. <coughs> Um, some other things uh, have to do with the place identity, the bonding of the place. This is where family was, and these were big families. Uh, you wanted to have a lot of children in those days because as an agricultural community, children were sources of labor. You could send them out to work in the fields, to, uh, to uh, watch the sheep, to do any number of tasks to help the family be uh, self-sufficient. And the people really began to build that sense of bonding, became convinced this was their land, this is where they should be. And after all, remember, the king of Spain had given it to them in perpetuity. So this was their land forever. Uh, they're a very tight-knit group even today. Outsiders aren't, aren't extremely welcome when they come in in many cases. And during the, 19, uh, uh, during the Great Depression era, the 1920s and, and uh, 30s, uh, we find that as these folks were forced back into the village, as jobs outside the village dried up, the men came back in, they were trying to live and be self-sufficient. But it was very, very difficult because, as I say, they had uh, deteriorated the uplands for grazing. Uh, the bottomlands during the good years, the good times, they allowed the ditches to deteriorate. Uh, the dam had deteriorated. And those things they attempted to fix back up in order to increase the productivity of the area. But it was very, very difficult. Life was hard there. There were lots of push factors causing them to want to leave economic factors and poverty. But, you know, they had this sense of belonging there. At least here they knew what was going on. Were they poor? Yes. But they had the comfort of their community, the knowledge of these shared values and ideas. And so they clung tenaciously rather than leave. There was no really good place to go anyway. And so they stayed there through the poverty years of the Depression building up into uh, World War II. <coughs> Uh, some other kinds of markers, uh, uh, and remember we're going back to Spain, 1595, when we begin to implant, transplant this culture into the Hispano homeland. Uh, the Santos, uh, we see a picture of one there from Dr. Nesran's book, uh, are, are somewhat unique to this region. Uh, in the lower right-hand picture, we see a photo of the Penitentes. Uh, this is a group of men, a religious order, who uh, thrived on uh, self-torture and flagellation. Here we see them doing a mock uh, crucifixion around uh, Easter. It was a belief that if you suffered in this life, that would somehow purify you uh, for your entry into a heavenly reward at a later time. Uh, at the right top picture is a picture of a cooking technology called an autono, and uh, it's made out of uh, sun-dried bricks and mud, and a fire is built to capture the heat, and then uh, bread can be baked, primarily tortillas, those sorts of things. These are fairly representative of some of the, the distinctive uh, cultural markers of the Hispano homeland. Um, also, we can look at linguistic markers because language, our language is constantly changing. You know, a few years ago I thought, you know, far out and groovy was kind of what was going on and now it's rad and I don't even know what's cool anymore, I don't pretend to, it's beyond me. But an archaic folk culture that's isolated has very little language change. Unless people are inventing a few words necessary for day-to-day -day life, it doesn't change much. 
And um, I've got a quote here uh, from one researcher who says, I believe there's no modern Spanish dialect, either in Spain or America, that can surpass the New Mexican in archaic words, expressions, constructions, and sound. So linguists have studied and documented this unique language that has persisted and evolved to some degree, but mostly the uh, a result of, of, of isolation. Uh, we also see distinctive Hispano surnames uh, uh, of, of people living in that area that are different than what we find uh, in Texas or California. These represent the names of the families uh, who came and settled in this region early on. The culture also uh, exhibits uh, particular types of folk plays and songs uh, from oral traditions uh, that were passed down from generation to generation. And these and other sorts of aspects uh, really play to identify the, the, the region. We look for the spatial distribution of these lang language aspects, the, the religious aspects, the technological aspects. And as we identify the spatial distribution and regionalize those, that comes to pretty much sum up the Hispano homeland. So, we see this erosion of isolation uh, following initial settlement. Remember that uh, it was uh, isolated until the Mexican era when Mexico gained its independence from Spain. They, they began to invite uh, and allow Anglos and others to uh, move into the area. But remember, as they came in, they were mostly along the, Pe the Rio Grande River, so the Pecos cultures were much less impacted. When the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe came, that served the steel wheel and steel rail, reduced friction of distance, and really allowed for a rapid uh, importation through diffusion of, of new technologies and new cultural things, largely tied to the Anglo-American uh, culture. Uh, the little town of San Miguel, which has the major church of the region uh, on the Pecos, had been the, board, had been the river crossing, San Miguel de Bado, the crossing of the Pecos, where the wagon trains would go from the United States into Spain. That was a major center. But when the railroad came, it missed San Miguel by a few miles. And then because of the importance of the railroad as an avenue for commercial activity, the village uh, really began to deteriorate. And that had been the main village of the Pecos uh, complex of villages. Uh, we see that um, the Anglo-centric economy and political infrastructure began to grow in towns like uh, Las Vegas, towns like Santa Fe, towns like Taos, but what we see is these little isolated villages along the Pecos were largely uh, uh, un unimpacted. They didn't offer f opportunities for people to earn money, so folks from the outside just didn't really go there. And then we see that uh, when, when uh, New Mexico became part of the United States, uh, the federal government begins to work on adjudicating the uh, land grant. Nowhere they're going to allow these folks to have all this land, these, these thousands and thousands of acres. And so what the government does is says, okay, you guys can have your little tiny village and your irrigated plots of land, but the upland now belongs to the United States. If you want that upland, you must move up there and homestead it like any other American. Live on that land for five years and prove up on it. Some people did, but a lot of people didn't. Remember, the grazing quality of that land had been deteriorated. Uh, the water availability was somewhat limited. And besides that, these were a village-oriented people. No one wanted to move away from family and friends. But some, some people did move up there and get land, but, but a, lot, a lot really didn't. And uh, within the village, now that we have an English system, it became important to know who owned what land so they could be taxed. During the Spanish era, the Spanish law said that when a parent died, the land was inherited equally by the sons and daughters. And if a daughter in the village then married a man from another village, she would move away and one of her brothers or uncles would uh, begin to take care of the land and use it and farm it. But what evolved was a very informal and, and non-distinct pattern of ownership. Nobody really knew who owned what. It just all kind of worked. Well, once it became part of the United States, the United States wanted to know exactly who owns what and how much so they could be taxed. And this became a real problem because these folks didn't have much of a cash economy. They didn't have cash to pay uh, uh, for these taxes. Uh, the women and children seldom left the village. Maybe they would go to Las Vegas to visit relatives, but the women and children were much more isolated. The men would go out and work at jobs and then bring money back. And remember, during that period of time when money was coming in from outside jobs, people decided that it was worthless, senseless to put in a lot of effort to maintain the irrigation ditches and the orchards and the gardens because they could just earn money and then go to town and buy things. So we see this deterioration of the agriculture
agricultural infrastructure in the village as well as the loss of much of the upland uh, uh, grazing resource. So what we see coming together is more people moving into the village during the period of the depression trying to make a subsistence type of living out of it when in reality the productivity of the resource base is much less than it had been in years past. So we see this persistence along an urban hierarchy. And if we can kind of think about that, and I'll show you some more slides next time. In the most remote areas like El Cerrito, we have the best evidence of, of, of uh, this uh, culture. As we move up to larger towns, we go to Las Vegas, New Mexico, and I stress again, Las Vegas, New Mexico, the real New Mexico, not to be confused with uh, Johnny come lately, Las Vegas of, of Nevada. Here we have a lot of Anglos, we have the Safeway grocery, grocery store, we have Pizza Hut, we have McDonald's, we have a combination. We still have the original imprint of the Spanish in downtown Las Vegas because according to the, the Code of the West Indies, the king demanded that when a settlement was made, a plaza would be set in the center of the town and it, it ordered how things would be laid out and those patterns still persist. But today it's been much more Anglicized and also much more Chicanoized. The, the, the uh, more popular culture of Chicano uh, 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 people, the, the Chicano culture has really come to dominate. And so we don't see very much of, of the uh, uh, Hispano homeland archaic folk culture characteristics there. So moving along that, that uh, hierarchy, and in between there's an old town of Villa Nueva, still looks pretty much like a little Spanish village, but there's a convenience store, and there's a gas station, and there's a post office, and there's a recycling center, and some things, and so we see that over time, the larger the town, the more it has been impacted or modified by the diffusion. That's what makes El Cerrito such a unique place, and secondarily, those villages along the Pecos more unique than other villages along the Rio Grande. So these folks hung on. They didn't go anywhere during the years of the Depression. Times were tough, but they at least were among friends and family. They knew what was going on, and they hung on through the agricultural depression, and they had lots of push factors, economic causing them to want to leave, but no place really to go. And what happens ultimately to depopulate this region is that when the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor in 1941, remember what happens is our economy is thrust into a, a rapid gear, jobs begin to open up, Pueblo, Colorado, about five hours away by automobile today from, from the Pecos Valley uh, enclave, uh, the steel industry really begins to grow and those jobs and that chance of economic opportunity provided the pull factors to finally dislodge the people from the villages like El Cerrito as they move up into Pueblo, Colorado. And so the Hispano homeland with regard to the original Hispanos is substantially depopulated. Some people stay, but most people have moved away. And as we follow this story uh, into, into the future, we will uh, uh, learn more about Dick's work, Dick Nostrand and his work in going to places like Las Vegas, reading the church records, finding the names to connect the people who moved from El Cerrito to uh, uh, Las Vegas, being able to track them to the present where he was able to actually interview some of the uh, descendants of, of the original folks that were there. So this is truly an archaic folk culture. I hope the argument has been made. I think Dr. Nostrand does it far more eloquently than I do in the first chapter of his book that was assigned to you for the reading. Uh, think about this Hispano homeland, think about this village as probably the most pristine, but certainly not pure, not pristine, but most pristine uh, landscape element of the Hispano homeland. So that pretty much uh, ends up our uh, lecture for today, and I'd like to take some time now to get questions or chatting. I think I can uh, read this. Uh, would the Amish be considered a type of archaic folk culture? Uh, very much so, and that's why they have uh, re they have maintained many of their old customs, uh, particularly if we're talking about the old order Amish with their horse and buggies and, and their uh, shutting of electric power to their homes and things. And in their case, they created the isolation, not from geographic space, made it hard to get to, but theirs was a religious isolation. They believed that they understood what had been desired by, by their vision of a creator of the universe. And so they felt that the higher order of a deity was charging them to maintain certain ways of life. So it's not geographic isolation, but in this case, it's an ideological or religious isolation. And that's a very good, good comparison. So I appreciate that, that comment out there. 
What else is on your guys' mind today? Uh, when speaking about archaic cultures, would they be considered behind the times or exactly where they want to be? Well, that's a brilliant, brilliant question. Um, I'm not sure, I try to think of that term, behind the times. Um, I sort of think we think of ourselves in the United States as right at the cutting edge of the times, but if our economy crashes, we're going to be going back to the bad old times, maybe. Uh, so, so I don't know. Boy, and and that, that comment went away, so that, I didn't remember the second piece of uh, what it said there. But I think, I think that, you know, because they felt, because they felt comfortable there, uh, they were probably where they wanted to be. They chose to be there at least until they had economic uh, ways to uh, to get out of the out of that village. Um, so that, I don't know. I don't know if it says exactly where they want to be, but uh, it certainly was the right place for them at the time. Um, so I, and I don't I don't think they considered themselves behind. I really think that they felt they had that sense of pride and belonging. This was their culture. Look at the face of the guy sitting on that in the picture on the picture on the right. He looks like he's proud. He's the dude. He's uh, he's really glad for what's going on there. Um, with regard to today, um, I haven't seen any children in the village, and sometimes most sometimes most of the people there. Uh, either their children are raised, uh, have, have grown up, that sort of thing. Uh, when I first started going out there, and in through the 1980s, yes, indeed, uh, there were children there. Rich Kana, Rich Kana had his children there. Boy, boy, I think we hear some thunder off in the canyon. Well, it doesn't. Last time I was out there, it hailed a lot after a thunderstorm like that. But uh, he had uh, several children being raised there. Uh, at one time, the population uh, in, in the modern era, in the 1980s, got up to, I think, eight children in the village. And that was sort of a threshold. If you had eight or more children in the village, then the state would help provide a van to take the students from El Cerrito uh, to either Villanueva or Las Vegas to go to school. It's a hellacious drive to get to a town with a school every day. When it rains, you can't get out of the canyon. When it snows, you can't get out of the canyon. So I don't think there are any children living there today, and I doubt there probably will be anytime soon because there aren't uh, people of uh, the parent variety uh, living there trying to raise children. Let's uh, see, and old LB says, I wouldn't think they would either. Proud is a good way to put it. Yeah, they were proud. You're exactly right. Uh, they, that's that sense of belonging that, that people of a homeland have. Uh, they, and even today, the people, when you go in there, they, they look at you as outsiders and they're suspicious. When you drive into the village, uh, if someone's coming out of the village on this tiny windy road, they'll get their truck right in the middle of the road. So you have to slow down and pull way over to the side and let them by. And they give you the evil eye. They want you to know you've been spotted. They know an outsider is there and you just better watch your step. How about some more questions here? My gosh. I grew up in the country. Can I, I can read? Yeah, four out. Yeah. And imagine if, if you, if in living the country, instead of just living, you know, we, we mostly think of dispersed farms, families on dispersed farms. Think about how much stronger that would be if everyone in the community lived in the village then went out to the fields and came back. I mean, you know everybody, people in the village have known everybody for generations. There's a real sense of belonging um, that, that, get, that just really helps tie them to the land. But remember today, none of the original people are there anymore. They've all gone away or died, and the people who are there now are kind of the new generation of, uh, of, of Pecos on Cly uh, enclavers. And it's a, it's a whole different game in this sense. They still have a sense of identity and belonging, but it's been much more popularized by the Chicano culture influences and, and outside Anglos as well. Uh, that's a good, the question is, how did they learn about those jobs? You know, I, that's a brilliant question, and I don't have a precise answer for that. I'm guessing that someone had a cousin or, or a grandparent or some relative or something that happened to uh, hear about those jobs. You know, uh, during the time of the Depression, the word of job spread, and uh, there must have been some sort of a network in which people were passing information from one to another. That's a really good question, and I, I just don't know. Uh, in talking about the transition being Spanish to Mexican, uh, Spanish really refers to people from Spain. 
in Mexico refers to people from Mexico. And obviously a lot of Spaniards went to Mexico, stayed, integrated in that culture. And so the Mexican culture is sort of a combination of, of the Spaniard culture and the uh, indigenous cultures of Mexico. Remember that in El Cerrito, people went up to the village uh, and, and, and the whole Hispano homeland went there so very early that they took their Spanish traits. They hadn't been Mexicanized uh, to any real degree. And so they were bringing the Spanish culture characteristics. A lot of the people in the village are always cautious to say they're Spanish. Uh, they don't talk about Mexican food, they talk about Spanish food. Uh, Rose uh, uh, Torres, who uh, cooks many wonderful meals for us when we're out there, she talks about Spanish food. It's not Mexican food to her at all. These people in this region are very, very much tied in their sense of self-identity to, to their uh, Spanish uh, uh, heritage. Are there any records of men who are drafted? Boy, uh, any men drafted during World War II, that, boy, that is an amazing question. Um, we'll have to ask Dick Nostrand that, um, you know, in, in uh, certainly in Mexican-American culture, there tends to be an extreme pride in serving the country. And uh, that's also a major avenue by which people in, in, in poorer regions can get out of those regions, get some training, and quite possibly uh, uh, make a different life for themselves. So I'm sure, I don't know if they were drafted, it's quite possible that more of them were volunteers. It's a brilliant question, Sadie, and I'm just not sure of the answer. Keep that question going because uh, we'll certainly want to ask Dick Nostrand that one. That's a good one. So you guys are already thinking of things that, that he hasn't thought of in 30-some years, and I haven't thought of. This is excellent.